University of Michigan, but that doesn't mean anything. The world believes these things that we're about to study. So buckle up because it's going to be a little bit of a ride. But we'll do a, um, we'll do a quick review. Our study has brought us from an introduction on the subject of deception about false prophets twisting the word of God. We, we broke down some words and seen a few things about false prophets. Um, and we've seen how the ancient beginnings, the ancient peoples were worshiping the sun. And they were, they had knowledge of the sun thinking that it was their savior, thinking that uh, it was the light of the world and that there was no life without the sun. And in reality, if you really think about it, that's true. There is truth in that, that without the sun, no plants grow, you know, uh, um, no food grows, things like that. So there is a bit of truth in that. But what they've done is now, after the word of God has been written, they are transposing what they believed in the old ancient times into our Bible and saying that our Bible is nothing more than a perversion of the old ancient thinking. So. I titled this message, The Interpretation of the Heavens. And you'll see why here in a minute. So all throughout the Old Testament, uh, it's filled, if you don't know this, it is filled with sun worship. The Is children of Israel were sun worshipers. Solomon was a sun worshiper. You can't really see it unless you really dig in and know what's going on. But let's turn to Deuteronomy 4 right quick. Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel as they're about to enter into the promised land. He says, only take heed to yourselves and keep your soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. But teach them to your sons and to your sons' sons, especially the day that you stood before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And you came near, and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire into the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only you heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded to you which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that you might do them in the land whither you go over to possess it. Take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Unless thou lift, lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations, under the whole heaven. It is very clear right there that God tells them, do not look up in the heavens. When you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, do not worship them. All right? Just like he's saying, don't worship any male or female, any animals, any fish, anything but me. So, did Israel listen? No. They didn't listen. They worshiped the sun god of all the different lands. So Baal of Phoenicia, Molech, Milcom of the Ammonites, Hadad of the Assyrians. Now, and most likely, if we remember, the Jews, the Israelites, were in Egypt for 400 years plus. And while they were there, 
of course, they fell under the Egyptians. So when they got carried out from Egypt back into the land of Canaan, not only did they mix with all the Canaanite tribes that they were told to get rid of, but they also had their original thinking, which was Egyptian. And the Egyptian worship was sun worship. The Egyptian sun god was called Ra. Everybody heard that? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but Pharaoh, the word Pharaoh comes from the word Phra, which means the sun. Oh, wow. All right. Another interesting thing is Genesis 41 to 45 is when Pharaoh gives Joshua, I mean, sorry, Joseph, Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife. That word Potiphar means he belongs to Ra. So they were naming the children after the, after the son. All kinds of things were going on. Now, we started off at Babylon last week talking about the ancients and their sun worship. Now we're going to move to Egypt. Egypt got their worship of the sun and all of their religious practices, ceremonies, and rituals from Babylon. That's where it came from. More than 3,000 years before Christianity... The Egyptians were worshiping the rising sun or the morning sun. The morning sun was depicted as a newborn babe. And this newborn babe's name was, anybody know? Horus. Who's heard of that? The eye of Horus. Anybody? Is that on the dollar bill at the top of the pyramid? That's the all-seeing eye. Oh. But... It, it does tie in with Horus, yes. So Horus, in the Egyptian culture, is the son of Osiris. Now, I want, I want to make sure I express these things clearly. Because as we look at names, they carry on through civilizations, all right? So he's the son of Osiris. The son of Isis is the woman. Which is the same as Nimrod, Samarimus, in Babylon. You see? Now, what's interesting, too, and you can... Do your research on this. And I couldn't find it anywhere, but I've heard it from a couple different sources that we get our word horizon from Horus. Horus risen. So if he's the sun god, he's worshipped as the sun, and he rises over the, he starts rising up, people would say Horus is risen. And that's where you get the horizon from. Um, they also say, commentaries also say that we get the the word hours from Horus. People used to say, what Horus time is it? And they just switched the letters around and it would, be, it would be hours. Where is the sun at? Now, I'll show you something here. This is Samaramis, Tammuz, or Isis, and Horus. Let's see if y'all see something familiar. Wow. What's that? Who's that? Mary and Jesus. Mary and Jesus. Yeah. All right. Let's continue on. We'll leave that in your thoughts right, right quick. Now, Horus is pictured. We'll go back here. You see as a falcon or a hawk. Sometimes as a hawk, sometimes as a dove. Now, what's interesting about that is that those are governmental terms in Egypt, they were used for government, whether for enemies or the dove being for peace. What's interesting is we still use those same terms in our government. Now I'm going to read something for you right quick. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever heard this? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, what, this website talks about the budget deficit. All right? Mm -hmm. I'll just read it for you. A deficit hawk insist that there must be spending cuts and revenue increases to halt the growing deficit. Most Republicans and most conservative Democrats in Congress are deficit hawks. All right, call them hawks. A deficit dove, on the other hand, believes that concerns about short-term deficits are less important and attempts to shrink them should not override temporary efforts to foster economic growth. President Obama is a deficit dove. And then we have the old ancient symbol for wisdom, which is an owl. I added that in here. Uh, 
Then there's the deficit owl. Owls believe that concerns over budget deficits are misplaced and don't think we ever need to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. So just showing you that we're using old Babylonian terms still in our government. This newborn son at daybreak is said to be born again or resurrected from the dead. Now, we're not going to stay on the sun for too long. I'm transitioning into something else. I want you to listen to, to what Albert Pike has to say. So when we look at the Bible and we see the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then we look back on ancient times, we see different gods, sun gods who have been killed, buried, and resurrected. And they're called the Son of God. All right? I want to read something for you. Horus, this is from Morals and Dogma, uh, Albert Pike. Horus, the son of Isis, is the same as Apollo, or the sun. Uh, also died and was restored again to life to his mother. And the priests of Isis celebrated these great events by mourning and joyous festivals succeeding each other. We remember the women weeping for Tammuz. They had festivals for this. In the mysteries of Phoenicia, established in honor of Tammuz or Adonis, same person, also the sun, the spectacle, the spectacle of his death and resurrection was exhibited to the initiates. The mysteries of Mithras, the sun god in Asia Minor, Armenia and Persia, the death of that god was lamented and his resurrection was celebrated with the most enthusiastic expressions of joy. In Greece, in the mysteries of the same god, honored under the name of Bacchus, a representation was given to his death, slain by the titans. Um, at Samothrace, which is a place that Paul actually went, Samothrace, in the mysteries of the Kabiri, the great gods, a representation was given of the death of one of them. The name was given to the sun because the ancient astronomers gave the name of gods Kabiri and of Samothros to the two gods in the constellation Gemini. I'm going to go over that. The tomb of Apollo was at Delphi where his body was laid after Python, the polar serpent, and he goes on and on. In Crete, Jupiter, the sun, Aries... And then he says, and all these deaths and resurrections, these funeral emblems, these anniversaries of mourning and joy, these uh, places where they were raised in different places to the sun god, honored under, under different names, but had a single objective. The allegorical narrative of the events which happened here below to the light of nature, the sun, that sacred fire from which our souls were deemed to emanate. So if you didn't understand that, every culture has had a sun god. Every culture believes that sun god died, was buried, and was resurrected from the dead. Okay? Now, let's turn to Genesis 1.14. Before we look... Before anybody, once you get there, answer this question before you read it. Why did God create the luminaries? The sun, the moon, the stars. Why? Yes? To help distinguish between day and night. Okay. Close. Anybody? That's, that's one reason. Yep. Anybody else? I know what the verse says. Yep. So. Okay, I'll just read it here. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days, and for years. This is why God created the luminaries. All right? Now we're about to switch gears right quick, and then we're going to tie it in at the, at the back end here. So we just seen right here. All these different people, Egypt, Israel getting their uh, sun worship from Egypt, where Egypt got theirs. Uh, 3,000 years before Christianity, Egypt was worship, worshiping Horus, their sun god, and all the other ancient peoples back through that age had a sun god, death, burial, resurrection. And so now we're switching gears to see why did God create these things? 
Now I'm going to ask a question here. Who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Moses. Moses. And who thinks they can guess of what year roundabout this is written? You probably know, sir. I actually don't. Okay. 600 before? 600 BC? A little bit off. A little bit off. 400. Way higher. 1400. BC. Right? 1400 BC, the Pentateuch. What's the Pentateuch? Genesis. The first five books of the Bible, right. So Moses wrote the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, 1400 BC. Now, when was the book of Job written? I don't know when it was written, but I know it's supposed to be older than what Genesis is. Yes. Was it 400? No, older, older than this. Around, anybody? Around 1900. Around 1900. Now, here's what's interesting. Job, if he was 500 years before Moses, did he have a written word? He didn't have a written word. Right? He didn't have the Pentateuch. That was 500 years after him. So the question is, how did God, uh, how did Job, that's why I'm glad we're doing Job at yeah. Sundays. How did Job get his word from God, his revelation from God? He had a personal relationship with God. God talked to him. Right? We have a personal relationship with God. And God talks to us through his word. Right, but he didn't have the word. God literally spoke to Job. Okay. okay. God literally, <laughs> literally spoke, spoke to Job. To Job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, and if, this is what I'm trying to get at. God's revelation before the written word was in part the heavens. All right? The heavens. <clears throat> we know that. Turn to Job 38. Job 38. I happen to have that mark in my Bible because you're hitting my territory. <laughs> Hopefully I don't run up uh, on your toes. That's okay. <laughs> now, I want to read verse 31, 32 for you. Or, yeah. For, uh, chapter 38, verse 31. He's basically rebuking Job here, asking him, uh, he's saying, you sit there and listen to me and answer my questions if you can. Were you there when I did this? Were you there when I did that? And so he says this, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can you bring forth Maseroth in his season or can you guide Arcturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Can you set the dominion thereof in the earth? If you go through the book of Job, you see that there are many, many references to the heavens. God's asking him who created the clouds and the, and the lightnings and the rain that comes from heaven. And uh, Job says that the sky looks like molten looking glass. And there's it's all things where they're talking about the heavens, right? So before the written word, one of the ways God revealed himself was by the heavens. Here's how we know. Not only from Job, turn to Romans 1. Verse 19, or sorry, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, 
but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man to the birds uh, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You see, back in this time, we're about to see in a minute, back in this time, Romans expresses, Paul expresses that there was at one time, this is twofold, but God has made it known that he's the creator. Just by looking in the heavens, you can tell by the things that are made that he's the creator. But people were worshiping the creation rather than the creator who made these things. So when they would look up in the heavens, of course, God said, do not worship the sun and the moon and the stars. And that's exactly what they were doing, is worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars. And there's even a place in Job where it says, if I were to, uh, I'm paraphrasing, if I were to be enticed by looking up into the heavens and, and about uh, worshiping the sun and the moon, then, then I would be wrong. So I would be going against the Creator's wishes. So the book of Job is written differently. If you don't, if you read the first five books of the Bible, it's written differently. There's different vocabulary. It's different literary style. Um, and it's the only book I believe, go back and check me on this, I believe it's the only book that does not quote the Pentateuch. All the other, all the other books quote somewhere from the book of Moses. The book of Job does not. It's constantly talking about the heavens, and it talks about the Maseroth. It talks about Orion. It talks about Pleiades. What is Pleiades? Well, yeah, these are some kind of constellations, I think. Constellations. Yeah. Orion is Orion's belt. That's a constellation. So if the book of Job was written in 1900 B.C., obviously those things were in place 1900 B.C., you see. And there's a man named, I'm going to go down and read it real quick, John Barrett. John Barrett, 1753, writes a book, an inquiry into the signs of the Zodiac. He says this, and we're going to get into this in a minute. The division of the Zodiac into 360 degrees corresponds and implies a form of 360 days. If you don't know, the Jewish calendar is 360 days. Lunar calendar. Ours is a Gregorian calendar. It's 365 days. That of 365 days, near 3,000 years before Christ. 3,000 years before Christ. But this form preceded the deluge. What's the deluge? The flood. The flood. Preceded the deluge. The invention of the zodiac therefore preceded the, the, the era by not less than 3,000 years and probably was antecedent to the deluge, meaning these things were around before the flood happened. Noah, what did Noah have to, God did speak to Noah, but Noah also was able to look at the heavens and see things in the heavens. Now, I'll ask you this. Who reads their horoscopes every week? Anybody? Who thinks that that's something that Christian people do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, I got, I don't know if you guys notice, but I got a tattoo here. See that? It's a scorpion. And I got one right here as well. These are back in my, my not great days. And I am a, well, I used to tell people that my birthday fell in Scorpio. And that's why I got the tattoos, all right? <laughs> so I got a little experience with all this stuff. But um, there are so many places. Okay, so the mystery schools. Is Christianity really a perversion of the mystery schools? Because we've seen a couple of things. We've seen that prior to the flood... The Zodiac was around, right? These 
but we'll see in a minute what the zodiac is. It was around people looking at the stars, people worshiping the heavens, the sun and the moon. Um, we see ancient civilizations that have bear, death, burial, resurrection, the Son of God, all these kind of things. So the ancient mystery schools that's still around today through masonry and uh, a lot of these secret societies, they say that we are the perverted ones. So I want to clarify the truth, all right? Because you can see how closely related it is. How is it if we really look at if we're looking at the Bible? A Christian can be really deceived. This is why I'm telling you guys things. Can be really deceived when they when somebody comes along and goes, you know what? Go back and look at the ancient stuff and see if your Bible don't say exactly the same thing that they were saying. You see that? Because I just showed you that it does. Right? A lot of astronomy and alchemy and all that. Right. And so a Christian who doesn't know any of these things will go, I'm gonna go research, and they'll see a couple things and they'll be hooked just like that and go, wait a minute. And it'll crush their faith. What I'm trying to do is to, to increase your knowledge in what these people think and where all this stuff is coming from. That way your faith does not get crushed when people talk about these things. Because it's going to happen. Anybody ever seen this? Yeah. This is the zodiac wheel. All right? Yeah. Now a couple of things to point out. So, we have, I want to point out a few things for you. We have the cross. You see that? Yes. Yeah. In the middle is the sun. We have the moon. We have the earth. And then we have the 12 constellations of the zodiac and their signs and what they mean. So, I'm going to define the zodiac. The zodiac is defined by the annual path of the sun across the sky. So as we're watching the sun. Remember, these people back in the day, the Chaldeans, that's what they did. They observed the sun, the Mayans. And the, I mean, they didn't have electricity like we have. They were able to see these things really clear back then. The 12 signs of the zodiac are the constellations that mark out the path on which the sun appears to travel over the course of the year. The zodiac is separated into what they call houses. Houses. I want you, again, I want you to think about what the Lord Jesus says. He goes, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions, right? And a lot of people translate that into houses, right? Throughout the year, as the earth rotates and orbits the sun, the sun seems to appear in front of or in a different constellation each month. This is where we get our horoscopes. All right. So as we're watching the sun go around, you can see the sun come up into uh, Leo. And then it will come up into each month has a different constellation, a different animal. That the, As they were looking in the heavens back in the ancient times, they would see these things. And, and they would get a picture of a lion or they'd get a picture of a, you know, a woman or whatever the case is. And that's how we came up with it. Well, that's how they came up with them. The constellations that we know today were introduced to us by an astronomer, a Greek astronomer named Ptolemy, who borrowed them from the ancient Babylonian text. Right? The constellations are personified, meaning they're made into something like a beast. Right? <laughs> exactly what Paul said don't do. Exactly what Moses says don't do. Don't worship the, he the host of heavens. Don't make for yourself beasts to worship. And that's, they did both. In the same, same, same thing here. So I'm going to get a little, I'm going to, I want you to hold on, hold on with me. And I want to show you, share a few things with you. I'm going to try to break this down for you. Who knows what an equinox is? Yes. Oh, I, I, I didn't have my hand up, but I do know. Okay. Wanda, did you, you know what equinox is? The sun and the moon. What's that? The sun and the moon. That's an eclipse. That's okay. That's an eclipse. Equinox is the same day and night. I mean, equal time. It happens twice a year. Yes. So you have a... Well, what? That's right. So another way to explain it is when the sun crosses over from hemisphere to hemisphere, you get shorter days or longer days. One in the spring, one in the autumn. Right? That's an equinox. 
So the equinox is the passing from the sun over the equator. I just explained that. Now I want you to pay attention to this. After the, as the earth is spinning, we know, okay, if we're looking at a, like a 3D map of the earth, we know it has an axis, right? Mm -hmm. And there's the earth and it's spinning around this axis. Well, the precession of the equinox is when the earth is basically like a top. The bottom is fixed, the top wobbles a little bit, all right? This is the way they explain it. And this top point, as it's wobbling, will start making a, a circle, all right, with this top point. Now, the earth is spinning, but this portion is, as it's wobbling, it's moving around this in a circle. Now, this is what they say. They say it takes 26,000 years for this little point to make a full circle. But what it's affecting is, is when the sun goes around, the, or when the earth goes around the sun one time, like this, that wobble makes the earth stop short of its original point. Okay? So if we're looking at it right here, if, let's take this bottom, bottom part of the, the cross on the right, the scales. Everybody see that? Mm-hmm. If, we, if the earth starts right there, and it goes around the sun, all the way around the sun, the precession of the equinoxes says that as it comes back to this point where the cross is, it stops right before that slightly. Alright? It stops right before that. That's called a precession of an equinox. And what it does, it's actually 20 minutes. It stops 20 minutes short. And every time it goes around, every year it stops another 20 minutes short. And then another 20 minutes short, and then another 20 minutes short. And as you can see, it's moving over, right? It's moving over on the zodiac. It's moving over, moving over. And then once it hits the next constellation, they call it a new age. Hmm. A new age. All right? Does it ever make up the time? It doesn't make up the time. It continues to go backwards and continues to go all the way around. You see? Every year it backs up 20, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And it, it'll hit a new age. Then it'll do it again. It'll hit a new age. Do it again. It'll hit a new age. So is equinox and solstice the same thing? The, solst the solstice, you have two solstices as well. You have a summer solstice and a winter solstice. It's not exactly the same. Almost opposite. It's almost opposite, yeah. And what's the deal with the, the calendar for the Jewish people and ours? Where did the other five days go? <laughs> so, that's a good question. We can go into that. But let's, continue, let's stay on this. So what they say is if I'm at the scales, okay, it takes me 2,000 years to go to the Virgin. Really? 2,000 years. As we're going around, going around, going around. And as I'm getting 20 minutes shorter, 20 minutes shorter every year, it goes around. And then 2,000 years, it ends up hitting the next age. This is what's called astrotheology. Astro, astrotheology. I want to read that definition for you right quick. Astrotheology, listen to this, is the study of the astronomical origins of religion. You see. How gods and goddesses and demons are personified of astronomical phenomena such as lunar eclipses, planetary alignment, and apparent interaction with planetary bodies of stars. Is that where the New Age movement comes in? That's exactly where the New Age movement comes in. Is that Aquarius? All right, so here, here we go. <laughs> Get back to my spot here. So astrotheology. Now, what they believe, what the ancient people believe, is that Christianity hijacked the ancient wisdom, transposed it into the Bible, but we have no idea we're actually worshiping the old ancient deities. We have no idea. We're just reading the Bible, going along, thinking that our traditions are correct. But in reality, this is what they say, not what I'm saying. They say that we have hijacked their thoughts and that we just worship another sun god. That Jesus is just another sun god. That if we look into the Bible, if we were to actually look into the Bible, we would see all the astronomical allegories in the Bible. 
And I'm going to show you where they're going to show you these things, where people will show you, okay? They claim that our, our faith is nothing more than an allegory. Who knows what an allegory is? An allegory is a story pointing to some higher truth. All right? So if we think about Paul in Galatians, he talks about Isaac and Ishmael. He talks about their lives. These were real people, right? Isaac and Ishmael were real people, Abraham's sons. But when Paul is explaining it, he says the, real, the reality of it is they were real people, but this is an allegory of things to come. Ishmael was the flesh. Isaac was the promise. You see? And that's the way the two divided. And the flesh always attacked the spirit or the promise. And that's the way it worked. It was an allegory. He was explaining what that meant. This is why you can't understand the Old Testament unless you have the New. And you can't understand the New unless you have the Old. But. So. Jonathan gave me a book the other day. And I found something in it already. That goes right along with what we're talking about. This is a Freemasonic type book, all right? And listen to what they say. One must bear in mind that many, if not all, of the people of the, both the Old and New Testament are not real people, but rather an astronomical, astrological, or astrotheological, astrotheology, allegories based on the sun and the moon. And the planets and their movements through the various constellations or relations to the stars or other celestial bodies or arrangements. I hope not. I know. You see that? That person believes what we're saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is just another sun god. That all the Bible, all the people in it, everybody in it is just allegories for the zodiac. The same thing the ancients were teaching. Now, I want you guys to hang with me and watch this now, okay? <laughs> this goes deep. Moses. When Moses got the law on Mount Sinai, and he came down from the mountain, what were the children of Israel doing? Oh, uh, well. After the 40 days. The 40 days. Right. After the 40 days, he gets the law. He comes down off the mountain. What are they doing? What's that? They're partying, having it, right? They're worshiping the golden calf. All right? Now, this is what they say. This is what the ancient mysteries say. Let me show you guys this right quick. This is another model. Another model. See that? Sun's in the middle. Earth's rotating around. The trajectory right there as the, as the Earth is rotating, you can see the sun will obviously hit the different constellations. It's like a clock. Who, who's ever seen this? Oh, yeah. On churches. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an orthodox? Cross? That's actually the cross of the zodiac. Oh, oh wow. Okay, here's your horoscopes. Anybody wants to look at your birthday and take it down and go home and look at your horoscopes? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Just cute. Okay, who is this? Zeus. The guy in the ocean? Well, what's supposed to be Moses, probably. Yeah. It was supposed to be Moses. That's Moses, according to them. Now, this is what do you see on top of his head? Horns. Horns. Why do you think that's there? They're saying he's a devil. No, what they're saying is that. Let's go back. Right here. You see the ram? Yeah. yeah. See that? He's got horns. The ram. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 
on this far side right here, you can't read it, but it says Aries. Yeah. And then Pisces and Aquarius. You see that? Aries. Aries is a, the symbol of the Aries is the ram. This is why they pick Moses as head of horns. Right? Mm -hmm. As Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, this is what they say. And he sees them worshiping the calf or the bull. Which if you go back up, the, the bull is Taurus. You see that? Taurus. Moses is upset because they're in the age of Aries. He's upset that they're stuck in the old age and they need to move on into this age. Y'all are stuck in Taurus. And Moses is symbolizing Aries and that's why he... You see, if you think about this as allegories like they do, that makes sense. Right? Now, if the ages run 2,000 years apart, 2,000 years apart, what they're saying is the age of Aries was from 2,000 to zero. 2,000 B.C. to zero. Before that was the patriarchs, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way, all the way up. Noah, all the way up. And then Gemini, what you think about this, Gemini is twins. And they believe that that's where Adam and Eve, that's what, that's what zodiac sign or age that they were in, in Gemini. And then the patriarchs in Taurus, worshiping the bull. And then Moses and Aries. And then we come to 0 BC. Who's, it, who's in this area? Or is he 4, 4 BC? Amen. The Lord Jesus. Okay? The Lord Jesus. 1 BC to 2000 AD is the age of Pisces, which is depicted as to fish. Anybody recognize that in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Two fishes, five loaves, 4,000, 5,000 people, right? This is what they say. He was calling fishermen, saying, I will make you fishers of men. The Christian symbol has always been fish, right? This is the proof that the Bible goes out. This is to prove, this is their proof, that the Bible does go off their astrological thinking. Now, let me read something please. How many signs are in the zone yet? Twelve. Twelve. Listen to me now. The word of God is pure. Let's say that again. <clears throat> we understand that. Christianity is not a perversion. Amen. They are the perverted ones. And we're about to see it again. But this is what they say. If, if, they, if they are to believe that everything is astronomical, they're going to use everything they can. This is what they say. Twelve sons of the tribe of Jacob. God promised that twelve princes would come from Ishmael. There will be twelve cakes or loaves of bread at the tabernacle. During the de de dedication of the tabernacle, the leaders of Israel made an offering of twelve. There were a total of other offerings from the tabernacle dedication. Twelve silver platters, twelve bowls, twelve gold pans, twelve young bulls, twelve rams, twelve male lambs in the first year, twelve kids of the goats. They were brought over a period of 12 days. God, uh, God ordered Moses to collect 12 rods from each of the 12 tribes. 12 spies were sent to spy on the promised land. 12 stones were to be taken from the Jordan River to serve as a memorial that God had dried up the river. Solomon's throne had six steps leading up to where he sat. And there was a lion on each side of the step, 12 total. Solomon appointed 12 governors over all of Israel. The brazen sea was built to hold water for the priest, and it was set upon 12 oxen. Elijah built an altar with 12 stones. 
The Lord Jesus had 12 disciples. The woman with the issue of blood had been bleeding for 12 years. The daughter of Jairus, whom Jesus brought back to life, was 12. Jesus was 12 when he became separated from his parents after the Passover. He fed 5,000 men and 4,000 with five loaves and two fishes, and there were 12 baskets remaining. Jesus said that in the regeneration, the 12 apostles would sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul laid hands on about 12 men, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And it goes on and on and on. 12 is all throughout the Bible. 7, 10, 3, it's all throughout the Bible. Do I believe that God has a purpose for these numbers? Absolutely. But it's not what they believe it is. It's not what they believe it is. Now, turn to Luke 22. Excuse me? Luke 22. Luke, Luke 22. What I'm doing is showing you what they will show you. That's what I'm doing. They're going to show you these things, and you're going to find them out before they even start. That's the purpose of this. Luke 22, verse 10. Well, let's start uh, at verse 8. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall be a man, there shall be, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters in. You see that? What's that look like? A pitcher of water a person. A man with a pitcher of water. Yeah. Right? And we know that in the zodiac there's twelve. Houses. That's what they're called. Jesus says, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there will be a man who meets you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him, follow him into the house. Now, they will use this and say this is an allegory of the coming age of Aquarius. He is preparing them, saying, uh, Make sure you know that there's going to be a man with a pitcher of water, go in the house with him. He's preparing them to go into the next age. The next age after Pisces is Aquarius. See that? Now, the reason they say that is because at that time, did men carry pots of water? No. Women did. Women did. You see? That's why they say there's no way that Jesus could have told him that a man was carrying a pot of water because a man would have never carried a pot of water. It was a woman's job. So I wrote here, the mysteries say only the initiates know what this means because in that culture men did not carry pitches of water. Women did. And to enter into the house was to enter into the next house of the zodiac. The symbol of Aquarius is a man holding a pitcher of water. Jesus states also, this is what they'll show you as well, in Matthew, turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Verse 20. Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. If you go to, the, if you go to your concordance, this is the word for world. Why the, I mean, I'm unsure why the King, King James translators translated it world. Does that say Orion? It says, no, it says 
uh, aeon. Aeon. It means it means age. It's exactly what it means. So let's reread that and what they would consider. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. What age is that? In the Pisces, they believe. Jesus will not be the one or the Messiah in the new age to come. His time will end when Aquarius comes, and there will be another coming one. Wow. Now, here's another interesting. Here's another interesting. They also say that the Lord Jesus claims to pray to the Zodiac. As Jim Carrey says, we saw Jim Carrey say that you can ask the universe and it'll give it to you. If you look up into the stars and say, I want to be this, that law of attraction that the universe will give it to you if, you, if your heart is really into it. So they say this is what the Lord Jesus was doing in the Lord's Prayer when he says, on earth... As it is in heaven. You see. He is calling down the stars. He is wanting to live through the heavens. For the heavens to help him on earth. This is what they say. Hmm. Now. Who has heard of as above so below? Anybody ever heard of this? I think I have. Who's ever seen these two <clears throat> things? Well, can y'all see that? Y'all seen these? This is last year. I want to point out a few things first. As Above, So Below, you can do some research into it. There's actually a movie called As Above, So Below. And it has this exact, you see the obelisk? You see the water reflecting? Mm -hmm. That's how all the portraits will be for As Above, So Below. That's what it looks like. Another thing, you can't see it, but at the bottom, it says Jesus changes everything with the changes upside down and backwards. Remember when we talked about the occult, how they flip things and turn things around. Under the ball word. Yep. And then look at the date. 7, 16, 16. What's 6 plus 1? Seven. Seven, seven, seven. See that? Um. And then it says reset 2016. See that? Reset 2016. And if we look at the O, you see the O? Mm -hmm. There's a little space in the O, right? Right. You see that? Who knows what that is? It's not connected. It's, it's split right there. That is another picture of a, a roboros. Who knows what that is? It's a snake eating itself. Who's oh. ever seen that? Oh. That stands for resurrection or recreation. Alright? Now, we spoke about the age of Aquarius, which is the age to come after the Lord Jesus. Alright? I'm going to tie this in for you. If we're thinking about the Zodiac, and we're thinking about Moses being Mad because the children of Israel are still worshiping Taurus. There's, there's still the old age mindset. And he's the, the picture of Ares coming in with the ram horns as they show him his blasphemous statues. And then Moses' time goes all the way up to the law, goes all the way up until the Lord Jesus comes, right? And then when faith comes, the law is a schoolmaster, faith comes, and now we're supposed to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we're in the age of Pisces. And that's represented by the two fish and him being, a, you know, calling fishermen and things like that. And they say, if you think about it, from 1 BC or 1 0 to 2000 AD was 17 years ago, correct? We're 2017. They believe that the age of Aquarius, Aquarius started in 2000. What else started in 2000? What about, remember Y2K? Yes, the moon. What was Y2K for? Anybody know? Computers. Why? The dates. The dates. It didn't usually go that high. 
They didn't go that high. They didn't know what was going to happen. But it was actually to connect all the computers. That was the whole thing. Sure. The World yeah. Wide Web. Yep. That was the whole start of it. They believe because Aquari Aquarius is the time, is the spirit of air. Pisces is the spirit of water. See? So if you think about air, you think about radio waves, think about internet, think about fiber optics and all the things that are going on now. They believe we're in the age of Aquarius. Who knows who the fifth dimension is? The band. They wrote an album called The Age of Aquarius, a very popular song. They consider this the golden age, and according to some, it started in 2000. This is the age, I want you to listen to the words, and listen to what's going on right now. This is the age of love, compassion, and unity, and solidarity. Think about that. Everything you hear today, that's what it's about. Everything you hear. He is messing that up. <laughs> so really, it's come up to like 2044 or something. Like that. From zero to 2000. Remember, we were talking about Alice A. Bailey. Mm -hmm. This is what she says about Aquarius. Increasingly, as this Aquarian age dawns, we are becoming aware of the intimate relationship existing between the individual, here we go, the planetary, and the cosmic Christ consciousness. You see, the Aquarian age is going to tie in the zodiac, right? Everything we know about the zodiac. So it's going to tie in the ancient mysteries into open population. Everybody's going to understand what all these things mean. And everybody's going to have this consciousness of Christ. We are recognizing that the mind... As, Easter, as the Eastern people know it, uh, to which our own minds are related and of which our mental bodies are integrated part is also part of the mind of the cosmic Christ of whom the historical Christ is upon our planet the highest embodiment. Remember, a, a pantheist believes that God is in everything. God is in everything. And we are part of one cosmic soul. We're not separated. You heard that? We're all together. We're all connected. Animals and plants and... You see? That's the thing. Christos. The Greek, the Greek word from which the term Christ is derived is an archaic term that was applied to every initiate of a certain degree within the mysteries. All of them who were initiates were called Christ because they believed that they had the same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ had. He was not the savior of anything. He was just one who attained or achieved godhood. You see, that's what they believe. Every human being is a potential Christ. That's what she says. It is in the early years of the Aquarian age that humanity, the world disciple, has the opportunity to prepare the way for the reappearance of the world teacher. How better to do so than to cultivate and imitate as best we can the love and compassion that this world teacher continues to pour forth on all? Is it not incumbent upon us to, to help provide in whatever way we can the needed physical and spiritual environment in which this planetary teacher of men and angels alike will be able to once again openly and teach and work? Can we therefore use the transfiguring will to renounce and sacrifice all that hinders the inner Christ consciousness from manifesting into day-to-day -day life. All of it's connected. These people don't believe the Bible. They believe it's an allegory. They believe it's all zodiac signs. They believe it's all ancient mystery schools and we are just foolish Christians who believe this book. You see? A lot more would be proved resurrected then if that was true. Mm -hmm. It would be. One that been well, they claim that he didn't resurrect. Oh, he didn't. Right. So, but they'll say he's just like all the others. All them, those 2,500 sun gods who resurrected and died. What's the difference between Jesus and them? You see? Another thing that they'll do. 
Changing the word of scripture, we talked about that, to rest. The word rest means to twist. They're going to add to it. They're going to take away from it. And they're never really, there's a lot of holes that you can punch in this. I'm giving you the, the point, the bullet points. But there's a lot of holes that if you study, you can punch holes in all this. The occultists claim that if people were to replace certain terms... I'll share the terms with you. With the words constellation or zodiac in the Bible, it would open up to you in a way like it's never opened up before. These are the words. These are words apparently used in ancient times that are in the Bible. But they say if you replace it with constellation or zodiac, you'll get the clear picture. Tabernacle. New Jerusalem. Nazareth. Hall of Judges. Kingdom of God, tent of God, flocks by night, throne of the elect, abode of the Most High, labyrinth, most holy place, eons or ages, seasons, oracles, citadel, the seven churches, Mount of Olives, city of David or God, celestial kingdom, heaven and mercy. All these were names of the constellations at one time. And if we were just to take them and just scratch them out of our Bible and write, that's a constellation. That's, that's a zodiac. That's a constellation. Then we, would, then we can unlock the secrets to the Bible. You understand? Turn to Revelation 12 right quick. This is going to be our last example. Of where somebody will take you. Verse 12, I mean, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven horns and ten, uh, seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars from heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be devoured, for to devour her child as soon as it was, as it was born. I'm going to do it. Oh, an astrologer could tell you exactly what that means. Here's what they believe. Virgo, the virgin, is a constellation. It comes as, well, the next constellation is Leo. You see? It's, it's talking about a certain period of time right here. So as Virgo's coming over the horizon, then Leo's coming as if the virgin is giving Leo the lion, which is the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, giving birth to the lion. And right after that is the serpent right behind it as it comes up the zodiac. And the serpent is going to devour the child. You see, they can explain it in astrology. Now, I am not, again, like I said with Job, am I discounting in any way that God would write the gospel in the stars? Absolutely not. He did. There's things that they were looking at, but they were not creating for themselves what they thought these things meant. They were getting the word from God, just like you said directly, what these things meant. So is there, is there possibly some astrological, astronomical meaning to some of the things that God's saying in his word? Probably so. But the ancient mystery schools have perverted this. And they believe that it's all astrological, astronomical. This is another layer of the deception that has brought, been brought into the church. And people believe it. People believe the horoscopes. I mean, I just talked to Nelson today. He delivered parts to me. And I asked him one question. I said, what's your zodiac sign? You know what he said? Virgo. Like, just like that. You see what I mean? You can do it with everybody. You can walk around and say, what's your, what's your horoscope? What's your zodiac sign? They'll tell you. Just like that. But you can see it's false. 
but it's been so ingrained in us. It's been so to, uh, you know, to sit down and read our horoscopes and go, man, this thing is telling me exactly what's up with my life. You know, right? You must know what I'm talking about, Ron. Right. <laughs> so, I just want to clear it up again. Do you see how closely related these things are? They are very closely related. Right. It's layer upon layer upon layer. Last week we saw the sun and how they were able to take that word and just embed it right in the word of God. And it just looks exactly the same. Now you add another layer on top of that. Put a little more weight on the word of God. And you add now the zodiac and the signs and, and how closely related. And you can go in the Bible and kind of see, you know, kind of mix it up and see how they're doing these things. Next week. Next week. We're going to talk about. Evolution. Who believes that Charles Darwin invented evolution? The theory of evolution. Way before him. Way before him. You want me to tell you how? Wow. Way before him. Now, I want you to listen to this. The Hindu culture. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little tidbit right quick. Well, I'll say every ancient culture had a trinity. Every ancient culture had a trinity. So they got the Son, they got the Father and the Holy Spirit, the trinity, and they describe them as the, trinity, or the Godhead. Just like the Bible says, the Godhead. So that's, and they say, see, Christianity is not special. Well, in Hinduism, this is their Godhead. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. I'm going to show you. Right here, how relative is, how relative this is today. How relative is, ah, how relative this is, this subject is today. Relevant. Relevant, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Brahma, Vishnu, Krishna, I mean Shiva. Brahma is the creator. Vishnu is the preserver. The Lord Jesus is the preserver, right? Shiva is the destroyer. That's, that's the only difference between the Holy Spirit and Shiva. Now, what they believe is... The Big Bang. Big Bang Theory? Know that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they believe that the Big Bang started with Shiva, who destroyed all the elements and put a whirlwind. And Shiva does this dance, a dance of destruction. Okay? That's what, that's what he does. Let me show you. Let me show you what he looks like. That's what he looks like. That's Shiva. Alright? And he... Destroys everything and then Brahma comes in and recreates and then Vishnu preserves and the cycle starts all over again. That's the way it works. Now, <sighs> Shiva the Destroyer. Another name for Shiva is Apollo. Turn to Revelation 9. Revelation 9. Verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Polyon, or Apollo. Apollo is the destroyer as well. Now watch this now. Relevant? Is this relevant? What's so relevant about Shiva, the destroyer? Well, let's talk about this first. Who is this? Who knows? In the Hindu, everything has a female counterpart. Every male has a female counterpart. Yin and yang, dark and light, right? This is Kali. Kali is the counterpart, the female counterpart to Shiva. That building right there is the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. You remember when the lion, who was it, Simeon the lion got killed in Africa by the hunter? Mm -hmm. And they started projecting all these animals on the Empire State Building? It was the last year, right? They entered this in there real quickly just to, that was one of the projections. During that time. 
the destroyer. Crazy. Now, why is this relevant today? Oh, my goodness. I knew that looked familiar. <laughs> That's Obama. That's a Newsweek magazine that says God of all things. Oh, my goodness. What is Sheba? A destroyer. The destroyer. Why is he why is he why is he portrayed like that? That's the question. I have no idea. That's not Now, who's ever seen that? That one I didn't. Is that in America? Oh, That's wow. not in America. That's not in America. Where is that at? That's in Geneva, Switzerland. What? That's where all the banks are. Who's ever heard of CERN? Uh-huh. CERN. European Organization of Nuclear Research. Mm -hmm. This is where the World Wide Web came from. This is where they have the Large Hadron Collider. Who's ever heard of that? Where they're taking particles, mm -hmm. atoms, and they're sending them at top speeds and running them together and see what happens. See what, seeing what will happen. Boom. Oh, wow. So Al Gore didn't do it? Al Gore? <laughs> Remember he said he created the World Wide Web. Right. <laughs> and what they're trying to do is, if you go and research CERN, there's so many things that they say they're trying to do. But the director of CERN actually said that he doesn't know what's going to happen if they create a black hole or bring about another dimension. They don't know what's going to come in or go out of it. If you look at there in Geneva, Switzerland, this is underground. And it's a, a, it's a 13 mile wide circle. Like this tube that goes around. And it's built on the ancient temple of Apollo. What? This. Wow. Now, if you think about it, if we take the Bible literally, and it talks about the bottomless pit, and these people are trying to create a black hole. Mm -hmm. And there's a 13-mile wide ring that if they were to collide these particles fast and hard enough, it could... Whatever could happen. And it's just amazing that the king of the bottom of the pit is called Apollo. And that's built on the temple of Apollo. The ancient demons are still in influence. And, uh, Absolutely. People are. Absolutely. So. That, oh, there's a couple other. Especially one's absent. There's a couple other things, by the way. The second coming. I got him like he's hanging on a cross with a crown of thorns on his head. Oh, my word. That's terrible. So, if we look at Brahma and Shiva, and we look at the Zodiac, and we look at what we're going to talk about next week, evolution. That's what we're leading up into. They believe we came from fish, monkeys, man, and we're progressing into a spiritual evolution. Godhood. That's what we're moving to. They're trying to recreate everything by destroying everything. That's what Shiva does. Destroys and then it recreates. Then they recreate. This is the age to come. Aquarius. And the age of the coming one. Who is that one that all the religions are waiting on. The Jews are waiting on a Messiah. They're all waiting on Vishnu and Mithra. And all these saviors to come. We're waiting on the Lord Jesus to come. See that? There is an evolution taking place that's happening all around us that we don't even see. But we're not going to have to go to Darwin to figure out where it came from. We're going to have to go to Babylon all the way back again. So we're going to start over again at evolution. Layer upon layer upon layer, Satan knows how to stifle the Word of God. Oh, yeah. And he's all throughout the history of man, he's just stacked weights on top of it, stacked and stacked and stacked. Mm -hmm. And the only way you get into it, the only way you, God is going to ensure that we understand that his, the Word of God is pure. But to understand the enemy, you have to dig. You have to see these things. Because people will come after you with this. I go on YouTube sometimes and look at the comments uh, after all these videos, and you should see 
how many people believe this. There is tons and tons and tons. Really? One way or the other, either people believe in evolution, people believe in this spiritual thing that's happening, the age of Aquarius. There's all different angles that are coming, and they're all going to converge into one new religion. Wow. That's what's going to happen. And it will be the fundamentalist, the people who stand on this, who will be separated. Yes. What is, um, would you explain the royal arch of Enoch? I didn't get that. That's this book. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So are you saying Job's oldest Bible in her book? Oldest book in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Wow. I don't have a question. I, you know, Pastor Rose always said that, you know, 6,000 years ago was creation. 2,000 years ago, you were talking about in 2000s, was uh, Noah and the flood. 4,000 years was the birth of Christ or the crucifixion. And the year two, mm -hmm. here we are, 2000. So everything, is, uh, the main events has taken place in the 2000 realm. And this is how Pastor Rose always would share that. He said, you know, we're in. In times, he said, no man knows the hour or the day when the, the, the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But he said, we're there, and, there, and all prophecy is fulfilled, and it could be today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, but we're still. He said, when you get that year 2000, you can't take away nothing from nothing. You follow me? That's how he explained it to me. So, mm -hmm. But he didn't know maybe all the ins and outs that you've put here. But, but as you said, every 2000 years, mm -hmm. the way that... But this is what they think. The yeah. same thing. Yeah. This is what they think. So when we leave here, of course you've got a lot to think about. There's a lot here. Yes. It's heavy, ain't yeah. it? Yeah. It's heavy. Yeah. This is heavy stuff. I mean, it, I mean, but this is what's going on around us. And uh, I just want you to go home and think about, ponder on this stuff. And I want you to watch. If you watch the news... Or, or whatever you watch. Now now it's in sports. I mean, football. Uh, I want you to watch the language that people are using. They're using language like tolerance, love, compassion, care, open borders. You see, like, I mean, it has nothing to do with, with discipline, discrimination, separateness. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with all coming together. Watch everything you watch. All the news media, all them that talk, they're speaking the same language. All the politicians in the world. And then, if you get a chance, go, go look up. Agenda 2030. You get a chance. This is the agenda that Pope Francis wrote about in his encyclical. He brought all the nations, 190 nations who were under the UN. I think it's 190. Under the UN, under this umbrella of the Agenda 20, which has to do with everything under the sun when it comes to ruling a nation, uh, whether it's energy or immigration, or and everybody's going to be on the same page. That's what it's about. He's bringing all everybody up under this umbrella. And when he came to speak at the UN, and he came to speak at the White House, uh, 2015, this is what he was talking about. You so can go. All this have to come to be before the Antichrist appears, doesn't it? Uh, I'm not going to be dogmatic about, you know, but the way this looks right here is it, it, the world's coming together under the religions, under all, all the, the governments, the way they're doing it is under the guise of love and compassion and helping the poor and the homeless and bringing everybody under that. That's the oldest trick in the world. Safety. Comfort. Are there any questions? And then the slaughter and all. Well done. Good job. Enjoy. Let's break. <clears throat> Our Father, there is no doubt, Lord, that, uh, that your word is pure. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us this book, given us your revelation, Lord, that we may enter into it and read it, study it, uh, pray over it, Lord, and ask for wisdom and understanding. I also thank you, Lord, that you've given me eyes to see and ears to hear what the enemy's doing and given me the opportunity to be able to tell 
the people, your people, some of the things that we should be looking for. There is no doubt that I would have ever found this information on my own, and so I thank you, Lord, for putting this in my heart, giving me a desire to want to study these things. I pray that you make us like concrete, Lord, in your word, that we are, that we would stand on the rock, that we would stand on solid ground and not be pushed aside or uh, be of a wavering mind when it comes to these things. I pray, Lord, that you get the glory and the honor for what we're doing here. I pray as we leave here, Lord, that um, we would continually cry out to you to give us wisdom and understanding and to see the world in a different way now. To see it in a way that uh, people are trying to attack you. They always have. They're trying to attack our Lord Jesus. And they're trying to attack your word. I pray that you allow us to keep the armor of God on. Um, and to combat, to combat what these people are saying, what the world is saying with your word. Help us as we leave here, Lord. I give you praise and honor and glory for all the things that you've given us and allowed us to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.